All right, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us this month. We're going to be discussing securing the mergers and acquisition process or M&A process, uh, strategies for data protection and integration. Quick intro here. I, as we go through the slides, it's a short slide deck and I've tried to be concise with the bullets. When some of you see the content or hear what I'm saying, you may immediately think, well, boy, you're leaving a lot of things out when we talk about risk. Uh, we talk about system integration, post-merger, uh, cybersecurity pitfalls. The one thing I'd say to bear in mind is, is kind of two parts. First is obviously we could come up with hundreds or thousands of different things. I'm trying to highlight the most common and most important, most frequent that you're going to deal with uh, to help you out. The second is there were quite a few items that I put on here in drafting the content that I took off. And the reason for that is it was hard to argue they were as much a cybersecurity risk as they were maybe a financial risk or a business risk uh, or some other form of risk to the organization. So this slide deck was meant to be concise for cybersecurity related risk. So talking about the hidden cybersecurity risk, um, again, you're gonna see right off the bat some of these where maybe it's hard to make a correlation to cybersecurity or you're thinking they land other places and there's likely a lot of overlap. So don't feel like I'm saying this is 100% based solely on cybersecurity. But from the cybersecurity perspective, white glove services and scope creep, uh, and I use the term scope creep because that's what's used a lot in service de delivery, project management, um, but these two things go hand in hand and will cause a lot of problems. Um, your risk comes in in that white glove services, especially for a small uh, organization that you're acquiring or merging with, often will deliver additional services because they want to give that white glove service. When they're small, they're starting out, they need to build a name or reputation, they're going to go the extra mile. It's harder to do that as you scale and a lot of organizations figure that out when they reach this certain kind of imaginary brick wall. And as a result, they stop performing those or stop offering them. But when you're going through the M&A process, one of your risks is that you may not know about these white glove services because they're white glove and often not documented. And they often result as a uh, often come about as a result of scope creep where you were contracted to do one thing and then you kept adding to it and making it better and allowing potentially the stakeholders and the clients to add to it. You end up delivering something that's vastly different than what you put on the paper. Uh, one, it's very hard in the M&A process to calculate what your risk is, your cost, the number of people it takes to support this. Um, but afterwards, once you're through the M&A part and we talk about the post-merger uh, risks and issues that you're going to contend with, these are going to pop up. And that's really where you end up seeing it in most cases. When you're going through the M&A process, these things don't pop up natively. Um, I don't think most people think about asking, talking about it, getting it documented. You just go through the process. It's not a big issue. And then at the post-merger portion, uh, every day it seems like you're turning around learning something new. If you can get this out front, it's going to save you a lot of time and reduce a lot of risk. The cybersecurity risk specifically, though, is going to be around configurations and who's doing what. Um, privileged access, uh, separation of duties, um, concept of least privilege. Uh, documentation and the security of that documentation, um, usernames and passwords and accounts, all sorts of things that are going to go along with each one of those services that you likely aren't going to know about. You're also going to be looking for missing, expired, or inadvertently billed services. There's a lot of times that a, a, maybe a vendor will go out of business, you'll change vendors, you don't realize that that particular client uh, or the company that you're merging with was using them and all of a sudden the service stopped but you kept paying for it or vice versa, the billing stopped you thought you had the service there and you don't. That's going to pose a risk in a lot of ways. Compliance is normally the first one where it pops up because you might be on a one year or three year uh, cycle for an audit. You went through the audit two years ago. You're coming up on year three. This was something you were able to provide evidence of and all of a sudden you can't do that. So that's going to be a huge risk, especially if you are a larger, more mature organization who already goes through types of audits and then you're acquiring a company and these potential companies uh, present the risk of pulling you out of compliance, uh, giving you a negative mark on your audit, those kinds of things. Sunsetting of services, a lot of risk there. There's a lot of duplicate um, services or functionality in a lot of places. You go to sunset, you don't know that when you sunset something, you're actually removing some form of functionality somewhere that you weren't aware of. Um, presents a risk because if we're wearing the security hat, if we're talking about vulnerability management, risk management, change management, you might be impacting those uh, 
processes and departments, depending on how, how large your organization is, without even knowing about it. Uh, the two at the bottom are going to be the ones I think you just will encounter the most and see the most. Um, the first one's the difference in the parent-child service descriptions, benchmarks, and SLAs. I use the term parent-child. I'm going to use that throughout as the parent being the one making the acquisition and the child being the one who's acquired. Nothing to do with size, who's bigger, who's more mature, just that relationship from an M&A process. The parent is the one that likely is going to integrate and absorb the child in most cases. And later I'll, I'll speak of a case where this is maybe not going to happen, but you are going to bring in all of their descriptions, their benchmarks, their SLAs, their configurations. If you don't know about these things ahead of time, it presents a lot of risk, not only for the systems and functionality, but making sure something's not missed from a cybersecurity and compliance perspective. And that's why the last bullet was thrown up there. You, you really pose this risk of creating a non-compliant situation. And it really looks like, hey, one day I'm sitting here before the M&A uh, acquisition process finalizes or is inked, and I'm sitting pretty, I'm compliant, I have all my evidence, evidence, and then all of a sudden the day after, you're totally out of compliance, everything's out of whack, and you've got dozens of controls that you have to contend with that you may or may not even know how you're going to do it depending on the timing of when your next audit is or if your evidence has to be gathered on a per quarter basis you may pull yourself out of compliance one of the things that you're likely to see is hey i can't integrate this company right now or i can only integrate portions of the company i can't include them in my audit they won't fall under the umbrella of the audit and the scope and the boundary so there's a lot that comes up the more you can ask up front the better off you're going to be um, in most cases and the reason why i didn't put it on this slide asking what services do you offer, what vendors do you use, what tools do you have, that, that's a standard process. Um, every now and then someone might miss one, but for the most part, you can go look at your you know, financial records and say, who am I paying on a monthly or annual basis? And you're gonna get a list of those. So while it's a risk that you miss something, uh, it's not one that I think most people really encounter or deal with. And when it comes to actually integrating the system, things are gonna start to get a little more dicey. And this is where I said the parent-child relationship, there's kind of a one caveat or one instance where this might be different. And that is, I've seen before where um, maybe a smaller organization wants to move into another space. So for example, they, they want to move into any aspect of working with the federal government and federal contracting. They themselves are not well positioned to do that because maybe they don't have the security posture, they don't have the experience, they don't have the people. They go out and acquire another small company that small company may have a much better improved security posture because they're forced to via that contract vehicle. One of the things that you have to be careful of is as the parent, there's this inherent feeling, I guess, that everyone should, should come in and rebadge to the way you do things and absorb your processes and procedures. But there are times where you doing that will actually lower your security posture, take you out of compliance, uh, make them non-compliant on their federal contracts, if it's, it's, it's a federal contracting space, et cetera. So look closely at what they're doing. If there's a way that you can migrate towards them and you can inherit their security posture and you can sunset some of your tools and processes, they've already put that roadmap together. They already have it. It's more of an expansion at that point and it's a much easier process. Outside of that one use case though, the majority of time I see it, the company who's being acquired or the child is usually less secure because the company acquiring them is bigger and had gone through this before and just through that experience uh, you know has more size more tools more vendors etc now you do need to perform some things uh, as part of this process it should ideally be occurring at the m a stage uh, at the pre kind of the pre-inking stage but it doesn't always happen because you don't actually have that relationship yet. You might be one of multiple companies that's looking to acquire this company and they just simply won't give you the access. They may answer some of your questions in an interview style format, but that's, uh, that's like an honor system. You're gonna wanna go review access control measures. Um, get rid of any unnecessary permissions. Uh, most companies have a just a, for lack of better terms, terrible process around people who stay with the company for many years. They've been promoted, they've moved, new roles were created, departments were reorged, 
and their their permissions just kind of followed them everywhere they went and they just kept adding to them as they went into their new role and they never removed the ones that they were leaving the role. Well, now when you come to be acquired, all of a sudden they might have five times the, the level of access that they need or five times the permissions and over different folders and data and tools, et cetera. So doing a thorough review of everything before you integrate it is going to help tremendously. Probably top of list is going to be open firewall ports and protocols and open vulnerabilities. It's easy to, to set up the tools to do these scans to obtain this information and then sit down with that child organization and say, OK, what can we close down from a firewall perspective, closing down everything that's not being used. You can use a packet sniffer to see what's coming across your network on a day to day basis, and you can reasonably close those things down without worrying too much about blocking traffic. Um, looking at vulnerabilities, you know, more than likely when you were in the pre m a stage, um, as it relates to the slide deck, at least you've asked questions about their vulnerability management program how do they remediate what have they documented what do they tell auditors but then you want to look under the covers and say are you really meeting the things that you're saying does it look good all year or only right before an audit uh, that's kind of a, a standard common thing that occurs is clean up right before the audit you're going to want to also purge inaccurate data before you start integrating every company is going to have some inaccurate data that you're never going to be 100 percent perfect but let's say that that we make up numbers and your organization has X amount of data and five to 10% of it is inaccurate and you can live with that. You don't want to ingest 20 or 30 or 50% inaccurate data from your child company and then create the overall problem for your company that you really didn't have prior to that integration. So anything that you can update, you can purge, it's a great thing to do just ahead of time. You also want to look at what is relevant, important and required. There's a difference between us saying, I think I need everything and what we really need. Um, this is where data retention requirements come in, and this is a, a double edged sword. One, you want to make sure you're retaining data long enough that you can meet any contractual or regulatory compliance requirement. But at the same case, you don't want to be retaining data indefinitely. Uh, that poses a cybersecurity risk from a if I'm hacked, if data is exfiltrated, if someone accidentally you know, post it on the internet um, with all of the different privacy laws and rules in place now and all the fines that go along with it, retaining data longer than you need to is a, a huge cybersecurity risk. At the same case, you're talking about integrating companies and their tools and their processes as fast as possible to avoid interruption to your client, um, a poor user experience for your employees. If you're, if you're moving and transferring five times the amount of data the, than what is really relevant and needed, you've just compounded your problem 5x. Uh, it's going to cost you more money, going to take you more time, poor user experience, etc. So make sure that you're kind of segregating your data and saying what is required, what's most important, and what would be nice to have, and then make decisions on what goes in what order and what gets potentially archived, deleted, etc. And last but not least, we talk about post-merger. Post-merger is, is where you're going to learn the most because that's really where the rubber you know, meets the road and it doesn't matter what you were told throughout the process, doesn't matter what was documented, now you're going to see the reality. And I think if we're being honest with ourselves, very few companies when they go through the M&A process outright lie. I don't think their goal is to lie to deceive. I think sometimes they don't know or have the visibility into the truth behind what happens. And what I mean by that is you can buy a tool for a particular purpose, deploy it, be using it, and the company says, okay, I use tool X for this process. In reality, though, that tool might only be deployed to 20% of the environment. Uh, another one might be deployed to 50%, another to 70%. You'll learn that as you get to the post-merger uh, stage of the game. And it's not, again, that anyone left it out. They thought it was deployed. They didn't realize that a project got to a minimum viable product and then paused because there was another priority and they meant to get back to it and never did or they deployed it completely at the beginning and over the years they've grown and they've never gone back and said oh this this tool has to be deployed across all of these these new assets it's, it's not automatic and they just simply didn't know forgot whatever the case may be the larger you get the more tools you're going to have the more likely it's going to be that you're not deployed across 100 percent of your enterprise um, and that's all going to uh, result in poor service and client experience. So this speaks specifically to the large vendor portfolio, but obviously this could occur on a small 
portfolio as well, just less likely because it's easier to manage that portfolio. So as you get to the larger portfolio sizes, when you start counting hundreds of vendors instead of dozens of vendors, all of this is going to become a much bigger problem. At the same time of having too many vendors, you might start outgrowing your vendors. You may have started with a, a, a very small vendor, a startup, because they were offering a great service, they fit the need you had, they fit your pricing model, but all of a sudden they couldn't grow at the pace you did and you're, you've simply just outgrown them. You've got to look and define and figure those out because they're going to pose risk from a cybersecurity and financial standpoint especially around the security settings when someone's developing custom code and they can't keep up with the latest in security and you're doing things like using legacy custom code that doesn't allow for MFA or it was coded and it only allows eight character passwords when we know the standards at least 12, 15 or beyond. Um, so things like that where your business is now you know, using this as a critical application or a critical vendor, uh, going through this MA process, that's a great thing to point out and see which company, either parent or child, might have a different tool to get through this process and you can just dump the one that presents the most risk. I've already really talked about kind of validate you do what you say you do to auditors, but I put a point this one out specifically in that wording because we all know there's a difference between security and compliance and while there's overlap between the two, very similar to a Venn diagram, there's ways that you can check the box for the auditor but not really be that secure. Go through this process, make sure that you're both ready for an auditor from a compliance perspective, but that you're also secure. Don't be surprised when everything you say you're doing, you're not doing up to the standard that you should. Document that, put a plan together to fix it, and then put the money, the time, and the resources to get it fixed. Um, how you do this is, is usually validating your due diligence data. So whether it's a questionnaire, interviews, whatever process you used for due diligence, go back one by one to the answers that you were given and validate it with evidence. Put yourself in the role of the auditor and say, if I was the auditor, what would I be asking for? And make someone provide that to you or mark them non-compliant so that you can get a plan to fix it. And then always be cognizant of regulatory compliance and privacy requirements. This goes without saying, I know you guys know this, but I say it because in an effort to get work done, non-security people will do and take the path of least resistance. And a lot of times from a, a security audit perspective, that will take you to non-compliance. Try to be upfront, try to be at the beginning of this process, try to interject yourself and say, I want to help you achieve your goal as well. I don't want to add time and cost delays, but you have to take a different path so that you don't cause us to lose whatever uh, compliance we have in place today. I hope that's helpful. Look forward to talking to you guys next month. Thanks for your time. As always, have a great day.